like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. With mercy for today, faithful you have been, and faithful you. Pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips.
Good morning. I want to welcome you to the Rivers online worship experience this morning. Uh, my name is Dean Ward, and I serve as the lead pastor of the River Church. And if my voice sounds a little different to you, it has not been adjusted by technology. It's been adjusted by some kind of cough that I've had recently. So feeling better, but my voice doesn't sound like it. So just endure with me, if you will. Uh, this fall, at different times, we have chosen to show you the beauty and wonder of fall. Uh, just the leaves that are turning colors, how beautiful and magnificent. My personal favorite are the reds that show up on the maple trees and other uh, foliage as well. Uh, I don't know if you prefer the orange, yellow, green, all mixed together, but I love the red. So that's why any chance we get to film in front of a red tree, it uh, I just take advantage of it. Well, this morning... When I left, my yard was covered with dead brown oak leaves. Covered. You could not even see the grass. And I thought, oh, won't that be a fun place to show everybody uh, my yard and show everybody kind of the results of the foliage turning yellow, red, orange. <laughs> my, my camera crew is throwing acorns at me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, this is a small oak leaf. Much bigger ones covered the entire yard. So I thought, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great just to show my yard looking horrible, covered in oak leaves and just a disaster? And I thought for a second my wife might not like it but I'm like ah it doesn't matter who cares if you know uh, we'll just we'll just show the reality of leaves falling and then I got home today and my yard was mowed and clear and hardly even a dead leaf to show you so uh, if when I was getting ready to film uh, the perpetrator that just threw an acorn at me said, Dean, your yard looks great. I'm like, yeah, it wasn't supposed to, but uh, there you go. Well, hey, uh, I hope that you enjoyed the series of messages we just wrapped up last week called The Discipleship Pathway. And I hope that you will join, or the series was called Pathway, and we were talking about the river's discipleship pathway. Uh, and I hope that you're open to joining in with us at the river and experiencing uh, this discipleship pathway, this journey that we have and are inviting everyone to join us on as we follow Christ and are disciples of him and become disciples of him. Uh, in next week, we're gonna start a new sermon series, which means today we have a standalone message. And I want to just share with you some of what has been transpiring, some of what I have been sensing and feeling, some of what has been going on. And so I wanted to invite you um, to this message today, just simply called Holy Ground. Um, something sacred is happening. It was a four-year period of time from somewhere around 1991 to somewhere around 1994 that uh, something very sacred was happening that I noticed and um, paid attention to and savored and leaned into. Um, I sensed the Spirit of God moving and working in my life personally, professionally, relationally, and spiritually at the church I was attending. Uh, I was 23 years old, had graduated from college two years earlier, and was not having much success in life as I uh, envisioned success looking in my early 20s. I remember getting a credit card application and I was so excited that I, 
uh, couldn't wait to, you know, it said I'm pre-qualified and I took it and I, I filled it out and I was about to mail it in and then I, I read the fine print and it, it said uh, income qualifications, you must have an income of $20,000 to qualify. <laughs> I was still living at home. Uh, trying to dive for golf balls, trying to get that business going. I wasn't anywhere close to earning $20,000, and I just felt like such a loser. So my career was not going well. Uh, then all of a sudden, I started to gain some traction. I, my scuba diving for golf balls started to build some relationship with people that had influence among golf pros that control who gets the golf balls out of their lakes. And I started picking up new accounts and st our company started growing. And we started recovering not just hundreds of thousands of golf balls, but in 1994, we recovered over a million golf balls that year. There was something significant happening professionally in my life. I remember waking up early uh, in the early 91 time frame and just being like so excited and invigorated to get up and get at it in the morning, which was new for me as a teenager who liked to sleep in and stay up late. This was a new dynamic. I'm like, what is happening? I'm actually can't sleep in because I'm so excited about all that's happening with my business. Relationally, as many of you know, uh, I met my wife on March 9th, 1991, on a blind date uh, here in New Kensington, two blocks over from where I'm standing right now, and my life was never the same. God's favor and blessing showed up in my life on that fateful Saturday, and I noticed something significant has just taken place in my life. Spiritually, the church I attended, we had been meeting in a hotel ballroom for years and we finally got our own building. It was a small church that could cram maybe 150 people into the pews and we started growing. And that little church that had a somewhere around 100 people when we moved into it, within three years, um, we, we couldn't fit any more people. We had three services and we were cramming over 450 people in this tiny neighborhood church that had no parking, no room, and yet God was doing something significant. I remember waking up on Sunday morning, heading to church with a sense of awe and appreciation, like anticipation, like what is going to happen today? What is God going to do? Who is God going to bring to this church? Who is, gonna God, who is God going to reach today with the gospel? There was this palatable sense of something is happening. I'm finding in this moment at the river 15068 a move of the Spirit of God in an uncommon and yet familiar way. It's familiar because it feels very similar to what I was experiencing 30 years ago. And I was drawn to this story in Exodus chapter three. And this message is just simply called Holy Ground. Something sacred is happening. And this is the story of Moses when God shows up and does something significant. Exodus chapter three, verses one through six, says now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. 
Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now this This story in Scripture uh, appears to be the very first time that God revealed himself to Moses. Now, God was at work in Moses' life from his very birth. If you remember the story, God spared his life from the plans of Pharaoh in Egypt to destroy all, (laughs) all male infants in the nation, in, in the Jewish population that were slaves to the Egyptians. And Moses, through God's providence, was spared by God, spared from Pharaoh by God, and then was able to be raised and nursed by his very mother. Very interesting story. God working in significant ways in Moses' life, and yet, it doesn't appear that Moses had ever really met God or encountered God. And from what we can understand, this may be the very first encounter, and it's interesting to see Moses respond. He, he doesn't quite know how to process this. I know that many of us have been around church maybe our whole life. And it's just been something that we have done. Maybe some of us have been in church whenever there's been growth and salvations and people getting baptized and you've experienced this kind of excitement and anticipation. But maybe it's not real familiar to you. And so I want to take just a moment and talk through how, how should we respond. There's this great book written by Henry Blackaby that has formed and shaped me um, called Experiencing God. And the single most powerful takeaway I have had from that book is that Blackaby would say, find where God is moving and join in with him. And that was different than what I had ever done because I had always asked God to join me in what I wanted him to do. And after Blackaby says, if that's your approach, I I would humbly ask you to reconsider, see where God is moving and working, and then join in with him and what he is doing. And so I want to encourage you to see God working and encourage you to join in with him in the work that he is doing, especially as it seems to be so noticeable in this time at the river 15068. And really in Lower Burl, with all that God is doing at Redemption Church as well, and in New Kensington with what God is doing with the church plant at Reclamation Church, New Kensington. God is up to something. So, how should I respond? First of all, I want to invite you to soak it in. Embrace the wonder and awe of the Spirit's presence and movement. I've been doing this a lot lately with several friends that are on this journey together with me. We will celebrate what we have noticed and then we will just be like, I I can't believe that I get to be part of this. 
I am so grateful that I get to experience this in this moment. This is so exciting. And then we notice that it spills out into our work where we're more willing to reach toward others and pray with them in their time of need and help bring Jesus to them and what is going on in their lives. There is a sense of wonder and awe of the Spirit's presence and movement that I want to invite you to embrace, to lean into, to soak in. Now, you may say, what does that mean to embrace it? Well, it may mean we have to reprioritize our schedule a little bit. (laughs) Uh, Brian and Corinne Baker, our associate and youth pastor, they had their anniversary this past weekend. Uh, But we had baptisms on Sunday and Brian said, Dean, you're messing up my, honey, my uh, anniversary weekend. We were going to go away Saturday night, but now we can't miss church on Sunday because we want to see and experience the baptisms that are happening. So it may mean that you would be wise to reprioritize some things in your life to make sure that you're in the presence of God's movement and work especially as it occurs Sunday mornings at the river. Now, the interesting thing, it happens more than just on Sunday mornings. Over the past year, I have been in wonder and awe watching God blend two different congregations together into one. From the River New Kensington to the Church of God in Lower Burrow, demographically, worship style, uh, we, we were just worlds apart. However, I have watched over the past year and a couple months God bring our hearts together. I have watched God meld us together, especially as we worship together in our former worship space for 11 months watching the 20 people that came from the Church of God and joined in with us, watching them experience who the river is. And yet there was still some restless excitement, like when are we going to get back in the building we worshipped in for decades? When are we going to get back? When is that going to happen? Well, it took much longer than we wanted it to But we are so grateful that in August and September, we as one congregation moved over together to our new church home. And the key, in my opinion, of this church blending together well was just the deep love that we developed for each other them for us and us for them, we have experienced a deeper, more profound love for our brothers and sisters in Christ who were part of the Lower Burl Church and they with us. That was a move of God. Sunday, as I mentioned, we baptized five individuals and then I asked Is your heart pounding? Do you want to get baptized right now? And I sensed that somebody was going to jump up and say, yes, I didn't plan on it. I don't have spare clothes, but I want to get baptized now. But there were no takers. But then after church, I had several people came up and say, this close, this close. The next time you do baptisms, call out to me. A dear friend put his arm around me. He said, I I want to get baptized, but I'm so unworthy. I just don't deserve it. And I'm like, well, that's the point. None of us deserve it. Um, This week I stopped uh, in the office. They showed me that we have close, I think about six additional people that have said, hey, I want to get baptized the next time you have a baptism. So uh, we're looking at the first of the year doing another baptism service because of the way God is working and moving. Monday, our men's group, We have 15 to 19 guys every Monday evening joining together from 6.30 to 8 for our men's group. This is a remarkable thing that that many guys pull away. Now, there's no beer. There's no alcohol. There's no cigar smoking. I know, you're like, why come? Well, the rich fellowship 
and relationships that are being developed in our men's small group on Monday evening from 6.30 to 8 has been worth the price of admission. Oh wait, it's free by the way. You don't even have to pay. We have a sacred time. Something sacred is happening in that group. It's not just on Sunday morning what transpires. Tuesday, this Tuesday, nearly 1,100 people experienced our building and the new renovations that we've made in our building for the very first time as our building was a, a voting place for this past Tuesday. I wish you could have been there to hear the people commenting, the people that felt drawn into the space, the people that said to one of the poll workers, well, maybe I should start coming to church here. And they said, well, yes, maybe you should. That doesn't happen everywhere. That doesn't happen every time you walk into a church. I took a friend a few weeks back into our church. He'd never been in the renovated building. And he said, Dean, I got to tell you, I have chills. I'm in this space and the warmth that I feel just with you and I in this space is so welcoming. I feel the Spirit's presence here. I can't wait till I got, can go home and tell my wife about this. That doesn't happen. Something sacred is taking place. Wednesday evening when I came to uh, my small group where we are watching season four of The Chosen, uh, before I... Uh, during, as soon as that video ended, I had uh, decided to have somebody else lead my group because of the cough I had. Didn't want to be infecting everybody else. But I walked outside and saw the youth group, the door open and Brian teaching and sharing the story about his new addition to his family, which you'll hear in a bit. And um, I, I looked and just saw, you know, a dozen or so kids in there being reached with the love of Christ and finding community on Wednesday nights in that amazing, renovated, welcoming space that you guys helped create. Something sacred is happening. Thursday, our counseling center is helping several people find healing and life and goodness in their life. 7 a.m. Sunday morning. <laughs> There's a group of us that meet at the church office on the in the house on the church property. And we just pray. From 7 to 8 a.m. we pray. And this Sunday morning when I prayed, I'm not quite sure what happened but while I was praying, I was sensing the presence of the Spirit of God, not just in that space, but surrounding me during that time. And I could tell something was going on. It felt like every single word that I spoke was being heard, attended to, and answered. It was the most powerful time praying I've ever experienced in my life. And I have been praying for quite some time. Something sacred is happening. In just a minute, you'll get to hear from Pastor Brian of answered prayer in his and Corinne's life and their son Noah and his wife Asia. I'll let Brian share this sacred thing that is taking place in their lives. This last Saturday, we as a church came together and lifted up Shelby Wildarczyk and her daughters Meadow and Ella as they grieve the passing of Yarick, Shelby's husband and the girl's father who was just 51 years old. 
and there were 150 of us or so in the auditorium experiencing the sacred celebration of his life and being drawn toward God to take that next step of trusting him. They had planned a worship to be part of the experience and it was powerful and significant. Something sacred is happening. This Saturday, we will once again experience a sacred moment of honoring a family by hosting the funeral service for Bob Bordenero, someone who is very well known in New Kensington and they were afraid that the funeral home would not be large enough. And I was asked how many people could fit in our church. And I, I told them, I think if every seat is filled in the back area and the balcony, probably 200 to 250. And they said, that'll work just fine. And so this Saturday, I'll be participating in that service and get to introduce a whole nother demographic of people in our community who have not walked into the doors of our church to experience the Spirit's presence and movement of what is going on at the river in a way that is compelling and sacred. Now, all of that is just what has transpired in the past seven days. So I want to invite you to join in with us. I would like to invite you to come to the river with a sense of anticipation. There's this story with Jesus when a man asks him to heal his son. And he said, okay, take me to him now. And the man was not of the Jewish faith. And, and the man said, no, no, you don't have to come to my house. I understand how authority works. You have authority to heal him. I have people under me. I tell them what to do and they do it. You can just speak the word and he will be healed. And Jesus said, I have not found such great faith in all of Jerusalem than I have found from this Gentile right now because this man had a sense of anticipation. If I can just ask Jesus to work and move and heal on my behalf, uh, I know that he will come with a sense of anticipation. Now every day I also come with a sense of gratitude which we focus on in November. But there's something very significant when you get up to go to your house of worship and your soul has a sense of anticipation, expecting God to work, looking for him to work because I believe he is working even when we miss it. And when we anticipate it, we have a higher likelihood of being able to see it and experience it. How can you respond? You can also join in and experience the wonder of being used by God to touch each other's lives. Now we all wanna know if our life can make a difference. And when God is working and we show up and we join in and say, God, I will help any way you need me to help. I will do anything that you need me to do. Now, you may think the only way that we need help at the river is watching kids. Well, no. We need technical experts. We need sound experts. We need people that know how to run a soundboard or who want to learn. We need musicians. <laughs> there are so many ways that you can join in with God and what he is doing at the river 15068. I want to invite you to begin to seek God of what it could look like for you to join in and just say, you know what, I'm going to show up and I'm going to join in. Because there's nothing quite like being used by God and making a difference in others' lives. The last thing I want to share, I want to encourage you to do. 
I want to encourage you to invite others. Invite others and see if they might sense God's movement as well. If you show up at church with someone on your side who has not gone to church in a very long time, you will be more attuned to the activity and work and movement of the Spirit of God when you are there than any other time, infinitely more than you have been before. So I want to invite you, invite. Don't invite your Christian friends. Invite your lost friends. Invite your broken friends. Invite your friends that have been running from God. Invite your friends that don't go to church and invite them to come and experience what God is doing at the river 15068. We're there every Sunday morning, 9 a.m. and 1030. I just want to end with this verse from Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Whenever Mary had given birth to Jesus and the shepherds had been out in their fields and the angels showed up to them and said, hey, go to Bethlehem. You'll find Mary, Joseph, and the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. This is the Son of God, you know? I I want you to go and see this. And the shepherds went, and they found it just as the angels had declared. And they told Mary and Joseph about their interaction. And then this little verse in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, that just simply says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Now, I have been doing this with everything that I have shared with you. I have pondered them in my heart. I have wondered, God, what are you up to? Who are you drawing to the kingdom? How are you wanting us to help them become disciples and followers of them? How do you want to bring healing into their lives? I have been pondering these things in my heart, and I sense this week God whispered to me, Dean, I want you to share that. I want you to share that with everybody online. I want you to share that with everybody Sunday. And so out of obedience to Christ, I share this message with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here now, to share this time together, And it's with great anticipation that we look forward to all that you have ahead for us individually and for our church. Father, we thank you for Pastor Brian and the work that you have done in his life and his family's life. And we look forward to hearing that story now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in with us. Here's Pastor Brian. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Baker, Pastor Brian Baker, Associate Pastor Brian Baker. But uh, today I'm just coming to you as Grandfather Brian, <laughs> or Pops, as my son is, wants to call me now. Is is uh, uh the other day uh, on uh, Tuesday. What is it? November 5th in 2024, I have a grandson, Atreus Scott Baker, and uh, he, he's such a beautiful child, and, uh, and we are so blessed. But uh, that's not where this story starts. This story starts several months ago and, uh, during the summer, and uh, we started getting results back from the sonograms and MRIs, and uh, Noah and his wife, Asia, were telling us what the doctors were seeing on these, uh, these tests, and it was, it was some scary results. They first saw uh, his, I uh, believe, if I get the terms right, if I get the terms wrong, I do apologize. Some of the stuff I can't even pronounce, the stuff they were telling me, but they were telling me, I believe it's his ventricles were large, and they're worried about too much fluid in his, his brain, and then they took another test, and they saw uh, a big gray spot in the back of his brain and uh they started telling us all this stuff that it could be and all this really scary stuff that was going to challenge his his physical abilities can challenge his mental abilities and even challenge the ability for him to live and uh so we 
of course, got really, really nervous and really scared and, uh, and worried a lot. And so we did what we were taught to do, which was go to Jesus and pray to him. And we started out praying just for his health and that he would be re recover, full, get full recovery and that this wouldn't affect him and that he would be born a healthy child. And then as I was praying, I kept thinking, well, what if that doesn't happen? What if things like, what if he does have challenges? And then as I was teaching the youth group, at the same time all this was going on, I was teaching the youth group how, how to pray. And we were going through Jesus when he's telling the disciples how they should pray. And the first line is that his will will be done. So we have to start out our prayers as saying, hey, Lord, whatever the outcome is, we just want it to be your will. We want to follow your lead in this. And then we started shifting our prayers, not only just asking for healing for little Atreus and keeping Asa safe, but we started praying more like, Lord, whatever the outcome is, whatever path you want us to go on, help us to trust you. And so our prayer shifted not only from healing, but also to this this life that we were going to live and trust and try not, not to worry so much and understanding that God was in control. And then as we're going through this process, and I, it got harder and harder to keep praying that because with each prayer, all of a sudden another test came from the doctors and there's and the results just kept getting worse and worse and not better. And the more we prayed, it seemed like it would get worse and worse. And then Tuesday came. And we rushed down there. They were having a C-section for her uh, three weeks early. I think she's 37 weeks. So that's three weeks early. And uh, if I do the math, guys, I, I don't know what the math is. I'm not a doctor. And, uh, and so we're there and we're all nervous. So what's going to happen? They said, we're, we did all the tests. We're not sure what's going to happen. There's, we're just going to have to wait until he's born. And then we're going to go from there. So we're all in the waiting room. And uh, it's a long day. Her, her, her C-section kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And the longer it got pushed back, the more nervous we came, the more worried. So we sat and we prayed some more and we kept praying all day. And then... We got word that he was born, and my son, we were all waiting for him to come out from the C-Sex, and, and he came out, and uh, he just looked at us all and said, I said, guys, he's he's fully healthy. There's he's, he's, he's healthy. And I remember his eyes were just light up, and we all just broke down in tears and joy and the miracle and the blessing that Jesus gave us that day that all our prayers were answered, that little Atreus Scott Baker is fully physically healthy. Now, there's still some tests to be done for long term and stuff like that. We're still waiting on that. But for today, we are full of joy of little Atreus Scott Baker and how much a blessing he's going to be in our life. And it's not lost on us. We realize that this could have been a different outcome for us and we would have trusted God with that outcome but it is not lost on me and the rest of my family how much Jesus has blessed my family and I'm glad not only that he answered our prayers but he taught us how to trust in him and to take our worries to him through prayer and I'm so grateful for that and thank you guys for listening this is our story about Atreus Scott Baker <laughs>